So welcome everyone to our Q&A with director of Fear Screen Fire, Mark Kachel, a veteran documentary filmmaker. And he is known for his social histories of social change movements. He's an Academy Award nominee and a Sundance Audience Award winner of Berkeley in the 60s, which I need to watch. That's the next film on my list. Um, which has become a well-loved classic, and I've heard a lot about that film as well. One of the defining films about the protest movements um, from the 1960s. And I am just honored to have you here to talk about A Fierce Screen Fire. Um, I am really enjoyed watching it with my daughter and having this moment where we could just move through years and see excerpts from really important events in history about the environmental movement. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, that's its great value is that it's a big synthesis. It puts together all these pieces so that you can really see how this big thing, the environmental movement came together of lots of different movements and pieces, causes. So what got you started on this film? And maybe you can tell us about the intentions when you first started out and where it ended up? Oh, oh my wife and I were going to do a five part, six part series. And, uh, you know, it was an obviously a big story that hadn't been told yet. And, you know, we learned a lot. I had, after Berkeley in the 60s, I had um, had kids and then gone to work in Hollywood making uh, television. Yeah good or bad, all got ground up into pulp. And so this was my coming back to independent filmmaking, coming back to documentary. Uh, uh, and what was I gonna do? And lo and behold, there was one of the biggest stories of its time, <laughs> staring me in the face. And, you know, this is my style. I do big picture histories of social change movements and that, that, that was a great one. It was such a pleasure to make. So how long did it take you to make the film? I think we started in 08 and finished, premiered uh, 2012, 2013, uh, broadcast 2014, you know. And you traveled around. I mean, tell me what, what made it, what didn't make it into the film? that you wish you could have included? Well, that led to the next film, which was about the organic agriculture movement. And that wasn't originally, it was going to be a multi-part <laughs> They all started multi-parts. And that was going to be the, the saving of the redwoods and organic agriculture. And the third thing was going to be renewable and alternative energy in California, a uh, big story that my daughter in college did as her senior thesis. And um, I learned a lot from her. Uh, never got to make that film, but um, there was a lot of stuff that we had to leave out. Even in the field of environmental health and pollution, there was just great, crushing, hard stories, real heroism and so on that we just, there wasn't room. We sort of signal here's Louisiana and you know, here's Ohio, and <laughs> kind of as we go narrating our way through. But we always knew we had to, you know, give some broad context and then focus in on a story like Love Canal. Mm -hmm. Love Canal, isn't that an incredible story? It was incredible. And the footage you had yeah. that I'd not seen a lot of that. I mean, it was incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's Lois Gibbs, who's the leader of it. It's her favorite telling of the tale. It's the one she shows, in part because it's concise. It's 10 minutes, you know. And, um, but my goodness, you know, they fought for at least two years for the center of the battle. And, um, you know, she was so good publicly. That's 
there's a lesson in there, you know, about why Love Canal is known, but the Stringfellow acid pits in Riverside aren't, is because mm. they have those gives at Love Canal. Really. Can you, for people who might not have watched the film yet, and who would like to watch it, just tell us briefly about Lewis Gibbs and the, the pollution in the community and the children. And yeah, I think that would be helpful. It takes place in Buffalo uh, or outside bubble, Buffalo, um, um, right, by the, um, right by Niagara Falls. And long ago, uh, a Captain Love had built a canal that didn't get finished that was going to go around Niagara Falls and he gave it up and the city got it and um, or not I'm sorry I'm getting ahead of myself it was used for 30 40 years as a dump for toxic chemicals and then Hooker Chemical tried to give it to the city and they took it and they built a school on top of it <laughs> <laughs> and that's where Lois Gibbs kid had started school and he was having problems and headaches. And Lois went to the principal and he said, listen, lady, I am not going to shut down the whole school for one hysterical housewife. And so she, she went around the community and started talking to people and organizing, finding out that she wasn't alone, that everybody had the same problems. And, and they built it, you know, they went to uh, call on the governor and Governor Kerry um, got a jump on them by declaring it a, a hazardous waste site. And, but he only took the homes that were immediately fronting on Love Canal, bought them out. And the rest of the community was left high and dry. And so they fought and fought and fought. And they, one of the most important things they did, a real innovation was they did a community health survey. And wouldn't you know, there's a story in the film, <laughs> who was it, this, the State Department of Health, they took the report and they literally threw it on the floor and said, this is useless housewife data. <laughs> um, I forget the rest of the quote, but um, by people who have a vested interest in the outcome. You know? Right. And, um, and they found the same things that uh, they did their own study and they found the same things as um, the, the, the people of Love Canal had found that there were, I forget the statistics, but there were people born with extra toes and all sorts of things. It was 56%. Yeah. 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 And then they dismissed it as a random, what a random cluster of genetically random. defective people. Right. <laughs> the audience just went. <laughs> and that was the moment I think when they lost. I mean, Lois pushed and pushed and got the EPA to come in, do a study, and show chromosome damage. And that really kind of blew blew the lid off of it. And they took a couple of EPA officials hostage. <laughs> that was my favorite part. That was bold. Mm -hmm. They kept they kept them in the building. They couldn't come out until I forget now what it was until they had a meeting or until yeah, they were promised that uh, they would have a decision by Monday. And I think it was Thursday. And their congressman had gone to meet with President Carter. And they were uh, they felt like they'd been heard. And um, sure enough, that next Monday or Wednesday, I think it was Wednesday, they got the call. And it's right there on film, a Lois reading the White House announcement as it's read to her. It's sort of like um, uh, Mike Check, you know, the thing that do in, uh, I'm forgetting how quickly we forget, never mind. <laughs> I don't know my chat. Well, that that was um, it, it was just a great I, you took us through every piece of that and they got it. I mean, they organized and the entire community came together and to see them accomplish that and have that success. 
And I think one of the great lessons for environmental health is do your own health surveys. Mm, citizen science. Yeah, you we'll call it now. You have to treat the uh, the state and the the, the the government health services as almost as your enemy or adversary. You you need to do your own health studies to establish harm and a history. Oh. Yeah. Well, I um I noticed then you take us into the incinerators and <laughs> the issue of environmental justice and yeah. how it took decades for these movements to come together. What he talks about is how he wrote a book called Dumping in Dixie, which was his first claim to fame. And it was about how all the landfills and incinerators and toxic waste facilities around Houston were in minority neighborhoods. Um, and it was stark and startling how, how unequal it was. And so he wrote about that. And, he started um, seeing it everywhere. He had grown up in the metal in Alabama in the red dirt black country of Alabama and a county that was 90% black, but there were no blacks on the county commission. Um, and so they cited the largest hazardous waste site in the country in there in ML, Alabama. And it finally came to a head in, in North Carolina. Um, there was um, there was Warren, Warren County, North Carolina. Um, many years ago, some people from New Jersey had come and dumped a lot of toxic uh, waste along the roadsides in North Carolina. It's just a way to get rid of it, sort of mafia stuff. Mm. Um, and then that needed to be cleaned up. And so the state decided in its wisdom to uh, bury it all in, in a dump in Warren County, which was no surprise, black and poor. And uh, that became the case where um, the NAACP and um, the Reverend from Washington, a lot of black leaders came together around that. And uh, so it really demonstrated environmental racism as a movement for the first time and its power and drew, drew power to it. And uh, prior to that time, um, you know, there'd been the environmental movement and there'd been the civil rights movement and never the twain shall meet and neither side got it about environmental racism. And it was a real education for the environmental movement. And, you know, it's a shame the Sierra Club didn't get it. None of the environmental groups got it. The NRDC, you know, they just, and it took that kind of grassroots movement to get it um, to get it on on the agenda and you know so you know a couple of years later you know there was a big march up the Mississippi River through Louisiana going through all the toxic alleys and all that right. you know and it and it brought together um, environmental justice people and uh, Greenpeace and uh, yeah, you know, there were struggles and so on, but you know, you start to see it happening all over. Uh, certainly, uh, there was a a, a fire a, a, a Firestone um, rubber plant in Kentucky. Up in mm -hmm. Michigan, there were a number of explosions in Elizabeth, New New Jersey, across from New York. Um, there was um, a toxic waste dump that went up in flames. You know, it was a lot of lit with it, and it just kind of all over. And Lois Gibbs went and started a group 
for her other Lois Gibbs. Yes. And she, she was really out to stop any more toxic waste dumps. Mm -hmm. And she succeeded. There haven't been any toxic waste dumps built since, you know. Her organization is the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice, and they do trainings, uh, you know, empowering communities, giving resources to communities to support them in organizing in their community for whatever they're dealing with. Yeah. Really important organization, and they they're quite active. They also it, have grants. We called C H E J, but now it's got another name. But I'm sure anybody who looks will find. Lois Gibbs, I think it's the Center for Health Education and something. Yeah, Center for Health, Environment and Justice, C-H-E-J. Yeah. Okay. So someone asked um, all the issues around electromagnetic field effects that have arisen in the last decade since the film's release are a sobering reflection on how challenging it is to address environmental concerns as they arise. Mm -hmm. What are your suggestions as to how to effectively respond to this issue and to all the, the environmental issues that we face now um, bringing the past experience forward. I resonated with the notion that we are all in fact planet doctors. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would just add in, what do you see as, you know, what, what do we take from this to bring to the future mm -hmm. challenges that we are meeting? Mm -hmm. What do you see as the key issues and the strategies that were successful? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, of the different pieces of the environmental movement, the conservation part of it has clearly been the most successful. You know, everybody loves parks and mm -hmm. conservation and saving land and land trusts and this and that and the other thing. And, you know, it's going towards restoration and uh, renewal. And at least around here in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's really impressive what they've done. And, um, let's see, the second part of it, which is wildlife and biodiversity, you know, that's been a tale of some great successes, like saving the whales. And, uh, you know, in spite of all continuing loss, you know, we are living through the sixth great extinction. And this is the, uh, what do we call it, the human era. Um, um, I'm forgetting what Elizabeth Colbert calls it, but you know, we read it and weep how it goes on and on and on from bats to bees to just everything. And you know, I'm then as far as uh, pollution goes, uh, which I, you know, toxics and all sorts of pollutions, radiation, right? Um, Yeah, you know, again, there's been a lot of progress made and a lot of bad things stopped. But, you know, um, it just keeps on being problems. And it's almost like, you know, our job is to bring up the problems and, and fight as hard as we can uh, to, mm. to address the problems, you know, and it's, you know, noble not that easy it takes a long time um, you have to be dedicated um, you don't get anywhere quickly you can feel very lonely um, um, <laughs> there's a lot of people who care about this one thing that stood out from making films about social change movements is that the environmental movement is the one that's growing it didn't have its day and then fade away. It's still growing because there's a need for it. You can't not address these problems. You know, and I talked about climate change in the film as the impossible problem, impossible to deal with and impossible to ignore. And that's still true and it's still imperative for us. Uh, you know, um, but there's something about environmental work 
where you just have to be dedicated to the long haul and being on the losing side and on the losing side and on the losing side until finally you win. It can be like a rear guard battle, um, you know? And yeah, I mean, green action here, um, I'm forgetting his name. He's, he's a great environmental activist and he's fighting and he uses every weapon he's got. Like you did not print the leaflets in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Go back and do it again. And, uh, or you did not do this procedure or that procedure. You know, a lot of legal battling in court and, you know, petitions and injunctions and, you know, discovery and you discover that oh that cleanup was not so clean after all they you know were lying most of the time about what they were doing or weren't doing um you know so a lot of it it's there are a lot of lawyers in this movement and there's a lot of legal maneuvering in this movement and probably the greatest of them all the first of them all was NEPA the National Environmental Protection Act which required that you do an environmental impact statement. When that came in in 1970, that was revolutionary. And it's been at the bedrock. You know, it's what everybody uses is those environmental impact statements. You can fight over them for 10 years, you know? And maybe in that time you can change the public. I don't know. Yeah, I was, Pretty, I, I didn't realize actually how soon, how just that, that was not so long ago. How, how, what was the battle for that? And was that, how did that even happen? You, you briefly talk about it, but what, what went behind all of that? The Alaska Pipeline. You know, they the, the Sierra Club was trying to last ditch effort to stop the Alaska Pipeline. By that time, Brower had left the Sierra Club. And it started Friends of the Earth, and they were really out front on trying to stop the Alaska pipeline. And they had some success with stopping it with environmental impact statements, but it took codifying it into NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, which is a simple piece of legislation. It just said you have to consider the impact, mm -hmm. you have to make statements. And, um, and it was kind of a good government issue. It was, 1970, it was kind of, you know, there were still a lot of liberal Republican senators around who mm -hmm. were doing the right thing. Um, so it was a bipartisan piece of legislation. And I think the Santa Barbara oil spill had been a big thing that motivated a lot of people in 68, 69. Uh, what else was going on then? There were oil spills off of Cornwall. Uh, the Hudson River was, there just can be, and famously the Cuyahoga River in, in Cleveland had caught on fire not just once, but multiple times over 30, 40 years. Um, yeah. You know, just the accumulation, the awakening, it really was kind of an awakening to environmental hazard and disaster and the need to to do something and it carried along even richard nixon yes you know? yeah and it's such an important law i mean it's it really although i know that it's being eroded and there are so many tax on it um yeah. But I, I know that in, in social work, one of the first things we learn actually is that the laws have always moved forward that protect animals before they protect people. <laughs> oh, well, that's what, if you see the film for one reason, watch Lois Gibbs at the beginning of the, of the Love Canal scene. She talks about how if the birds are dying and the fish are dying, well, then maybe the people are dying and how they were the first people or first group to kind of be concerned about the people. <laughs> you're, right. <laughs> you're right, you're right. It was, yes, it was the fish and the birds, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. It's ironic 
understandable, but you know, the environmental movement has not always been as maybe human centric as it ought to be, right? Right. Well, uh, or or not ought to be. I mean, it's all connected. You know, it's um, we're all so connected. Oh, talk about the rubber tappers. Ah, okay. So in Brazil, in the Amazon, um, there was a man named Chico Mendes, and he had been a union organizer. He had been born and grown up in the Western Amazon, where roads, as we say, had not penetrated. And uh, there had been big rubber plantations at the turn of the 20th century, like Fordlandia, and they had sort of gone away, and now there were just, you know, these people who were didn't own the land were just tapping the rubber and living in the forest and they were the people of the forest and you know um and um the the government of brazil um announced a colonization scheme which was called polo noroeste northwest the northwest pole and it was going to go up through rondonia into the state where uh, Chico Mendez and the rubber tappers uh, were, were really based in doing their work. And, and it, the colonization scheme was a disaster. They cleared the land and found that the soil was not fertile enough to support crops and it just was lost. And, and that I think motivated um, not only Chico Mendez, but a lot of other people um, to try and form a national union of rubber tappers uh, so that they could uh, come together and fight. And he ran for office and he, he became the leader of that movement. And one of the most impressive things they did, well, first they stopped Grupo de, de Bordon, which is Borden. Um, they had a ranch, a cattle ranch, because they were coming in and clearing the land for tax credits. They would clear it and put cattle on it and get tax credits. And uh, so the rubber tappers managed to stop the biggest ranch in the area. Um, and then they ran up against Dar Darley Alves, who was a local guy who was, um, you know, a tough guy and wanted to fight about it. And, you know, his son ended up assassinating Chico Mendes. Uh, oh, his son did? Yes, Darley Alves' his son. And, you know, and he stood trial for the murder and went to prison. And, you know, they couldn't let him go. Not, not, not the killer of Chico Mendes. Um, so it's, they, they started what they called empates, which is in the Gandhian and Martin Luther King tradition where they would walk through the forest and go talk to the, the uh, people who were cutting down the forest. And they would, <clears throat> you know, it was all very nonviolent in principle and they would not bring guns in it. But they, they managed to have some success enough that they, and so they finally won the first reserve in the world. Hmm. The first, um, not just rubber, but any kind of, material agricultural reserve in the world. And um, it was soon after that, you know, on Christmas of all days, that uh, they assassinated Chico. And um, the cause became so big that it sort of changed the course of the government and uh, helped to save the Amazon, to stop the destruction of the Amazon. Um, Adrian Cowell in the film talks about the Amazon and how it's kind of the lungs of the planet. And once you start to create holes in that forest, uh, the moisture can't travel because it, it rains and evaporates about 11 times getting into the heart of the country. And so as you begin to break down the forest, it can't, uh, carry the rain into the interior. And he was predicting um, or re repeating predictions from Britain that by, uh, by uh, 20 something, 2020, 2040, 
the, the rainforest would be gone and it would be mostly scrub. The Amazon would be mostly scrub. And um, they managed to stop that and turn it around. However, under Bolsonaro, it's looking like that fate is threatening again the, that the Amazon might turn into scrub and lose its ecological function as the lungs of the planet, which Adrian said would be a, would be a, a real disaster. Well, I know, you know, there have been so many uh, activists in Brazil who've been killed. It seemed like there was a point where it was every time I looked at the news, there was another person who was murdered. And I was just looking up a report from the Post that was saying at least 448 environmentalists were killed in Brazil between 2002 and 2013. Mm -hmm. um, so it has just gone on. And now it sounds like it's in a worse situation. You know, there's a great theme that runs through these battles and it's the battles for the commons. And that's the story of um, Wangari Maathai in Kenya um, and also in India and the Triagas and Himalayas and um, it's, they're selling off the, the public, the commons. They're grabbing at these kleptocracies. They grab the land and they sell it off and they sell it off to who knows, some Chinese or something. Um, and it's happens again and again and again. And it's, it leads to the destruction of the land because it's such a radical change from, you know, using it for the commons and preserving it and um, versus, you know, kind of clear cutting it, taking its resources and away you go, you know, much money as you can make from it. It's only worth what you can make from it. You know, that's, that's been a, one, of the, one of the sad things to see is how capitalism and uh, the profit motive and the kleptocracies have been destroying the commons. The kleptocracies. Yeah. Um, and, um, we'll see. Um, I mean, the Chinese didn't do such a good job either. <laughs> You know, where the government owns everything. Uh, <laughs> you know, the only thing worse than democracy is <laughs> the alternatives, right? Uh, it seems like co corporate corporate greed seems to be the what ties everything together. Yeah. And, you know, we need to be vigilant and always work. I mean, their business is always working. They've got all their lawyers. They've got all... They've got salaried employees working all overtime to, yeah. to make money that ends up and with collateral damage, pollution. Mm -hmm. So unless we're organized, we can't get far against this massive, which it just seems to be getting more, more and more. And you live up there in the uh, in the Northern Rockies, the resource extraction capital <laughs> of America. Uh, I'm actually in DC, but um, okay. Dr. Davis is in, yeah. So okay. where the issue of dams is very important. And- um, And mines and oil and all its forms. Yeah. The bitumen and the slate and the, you know. One of the very first films that was made uh, by friends who are also environmentalists was um, about um, canyon lands, about um, uh, Utah as a national sacrifice area. And, you know, they've been digging up, fighting over Utah, especially Southern Utah for, um, 60, 70 years now, that was um, 
where the, the Sierra Club first had some of its had some of its first great successes, you know, in stopping dams on the Colorado River. Um, after they'd lost Hetch Hetchy and Yosemite, they fought and they stopped dams on the Colorado, and then they lost, you know, Glen Canyon Dam and, and Lake Powell, and uh, that land is coming back now. <laughs> It's fun. it's fun to see in the drought how, you know, Lake Powell has a bathtub ring on it. Has a, has a what? It has a bathtub ring on it from the water. <laughs> and Lake Mead too, down, you know, Lake Mead is almost down to the level where you, uh, the inflow, the water intake, you yeah. know, once that happens, then no more water from the Colorado for Las Vegas and Phoenix and all. Um, Okay, so I have a question here. What do you think that, um, what do you think about this generation? The latest, the last few generations, how does that compare? Well, I've been impressed. I've, I've been really impressed, especially with the, you know, the activist groups, you know, they found a way, you know, where, you know, at a certain point, our generation, you know, I just turned 70. Uh, our generation is kind of had our battles and gotten older and maybe a little bitter and disillusioned. And, you know, we always want to lead the movements, but it's really nice that younger people are coming along and forming their own groups and leading their own movements. You know, it's, you know, how great. That's what you, that's what you would hope would happen. You know, that there would be people to carry on for you when you can't, when you, when you can't anymore. So it's nice. I'm glad to see it, you know. Um, Who do you see as the voices um, put forth in the film or also people working now that you think we should be listening to? Well, Paul Hawken has done some brilliant work, and so has Stuart Brand. They are just giants. Um, and Paul Hawken put out a very impressive book that's all about solutions. Mm. I think it's called Drawdown. I might be wrong, but it puts forth about 150 solutions uh, uh, for sustainability. And, you know, Paul's just very impressive. He's a great thinker. And Stuart Brand, even more so. Stuart's controversial because, you know, he thinks that we need to put up shields in space to save us uh, from climate change and that we need to go with nuclear power. And, you know, yeah. sometimes his views are very unpopular. And, uh, but he's a brilliant original mind. This is the guy who wrote the first Whole Earth Catalog. Hmm. Um, and he's been important uh, on a lot of fronts. Um, Mark Hertzstard has continued to do brilliant journalism. And um, I don't know what he's done since Hot, but Hot is a great book about um, climate change. Um, and who else is in there? Um, Jerry Mander seems to be getting towards the end. Um, um, I haven't heard from Lois Gibson in a long time. Um, let's see, who else was in the, the climate change movement? Um, Randy Hayes started the Rainforest Action Network. And he's gone on to do a lot of good things with people who are sort of the old radical environmentalists, you know, who would hang off of buildings and do banners and so on. He's gone on yeah. to serious work, but I haven't heard from him in a while. Um, Randy Hayes. H-A-Y-E-S, Randy Hayes, founder of the, of the Rainforest Action Network. Um, <laughs> I mean, it seems like the Sunrise Movement is 
where it's at around here, you know, they're the younger generation. Um, and it's impressive to, to see what they are doing. Um, I mean, Elizabeth Colbert continues to do some of the most important reporting around. Um, and I'm forever hearing from her. And um, I don't know. I don't know. Wait, no, that's great. That, that's great to get started. <laughs> so uh, a couple questions here. Um, what can we do about the 421 parts per million of carbon dioxide up from 350, the safe area? Well, it's going to take a long time to turn that train around, um, that ship around, whatever it is. got to turn around. It's probably going to get worse before it, it's definitely going to get worse before it gets better. Um, it's the sort of thing where it's hard because, you know, you have, kind of have to reap what you sow and you have to see the consequences um, to be, to get enough political power to turn yeah. around. And there's a lot of people in this country who are adamantly anti-environmental and don't believe in climate change and are really upset about it and think it's all just a bunch of liberal crap. And um, we're gonna fight it. And so until, the, until it really hits home, you know? <laughs> Steven Schneider in the film says, I don't know, do we have to have a hurricane take out Miami or Shanghai before we can, you know, he was talking about how hard it is to, to turn it around, to get people to pay attention, to get the political will. Mm -hmm. you know, the science is there. You know, a lot of the economy has been building for the last 20, 30, 40 years, you know, solar and wind and the things we can do to ameliorate and, and change it around and build a, build a society that's not going to cook itself. Um, but I believe it's, it needs to get worse before we and, get the political will to make the change. And dead children, I, I find children make, move, can help move sick, sick children mm. on TV, which it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be we wait till there are sick children Mm -hmm. And even then, look at Lois Gibbs' story. Yeah. Yeah, look at Lois Gibbs' story. Sick children. Moms with sick children. It's the Santa, I, I, um, I should have pulled it up. Just recently, there was the nuclear plant. It made all the news just last week. Um, and they're all those children with leukemia who are near or different cancers near uh, where there was a nuclear disaster that was covered up. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it just happened. Um, I'll, I'll get the name, but there was a low, it was considered a low level of nuclear ionizing radiation and in the ground and now there are a lot of sick kids it made the cover it made like people magazine mm -hmm. um but for many years there were studies showing that it really wasn't a problem studies funded by rocketdyne studies funded by the uh the industry the the corporation and people are living there. And now the mother was in the hospital and noticed that her neighbors were in the hospital too, right? Mm -hmm. That story, which is probably repeated over and over again. Mm -hmm. And they were like, why, why are all the, why do we all have, why are all these kids have cancer? Mm -hmm. um, this is, it is in uh, Santa Susana. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the valley, uh, that's LA, that's going up from the San Fernando Valley up over Santa Susana Pass into, you know, Reagan Library's up there. Yes, there's a rocket town site in those hills. 
Exactly. Yeah, Santa Susana Field Laboratory Project, yeah. run chiefly by the Department of Energy, Boeing, and NASA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do how do we watch the film? There's Bulldog Films. Bullfrog. Bullfrog. Sorry, Bullfrog Films. <laughs> And um, I, you know, uh, Ovid, if you don't know about Ovid, they have kind of like there's Netflix, except um, they have their own uh, subscription where you can watch documentaries about environmental health. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, our family has really been loving it. And there's also, um, name all the places where people can watch the film. Well, the big four, it's available on Amazon on um, Apple, what do they call it, TV Plus, whatever their streaming service is, uh, used to be called iTunes, and then um, Google Play, YouTube, uh, and then Voodoo, which is Walmart, uh, and is now associated with Fandango. So it's streaming on the big four channels. It's really available and easy to find. and. Uh, where else? Um, PBS? No, not right, anymore. Right. Um, but it did very well on PBS. But um, there's also a YouTube. I would refer people to a, my YouTube channel. It's just called Mark Kitchell, the films of Mark Kitchell on YouTube. Um, and there's, I do a pitch video for the three films, Berkeley in the 60s, A Fear Screen Fire, an evolution of organic, which is about the organic agriculture. And um, it's kind of fun. And you can see some things there. And, you know, so we worked hard on it. We did all the closed captions and fixed little things. And I'd like people to go see our films. They're, they're out there. Um, Great. Should we, talk, should we talk about what's next? Yeah, that, that was what, yeah, I had one question and then I was going to ask you to talk about what, what's next. So um, Walter Jehenny's work and restoring the water cycle beyond talking about carbon emissions. Do you know about that? How's the name spelled? J-E-H-N-E. -E. What about Walter Jehenny's I don't know. Okay. I'd love to know. <laughs> Maybe they can tell us. I'll, I'll forward it to you. Okay. Thank uh, you for talking about it. Yeah. So tell us about the work that you're doing next. Uh, the history of cannabis. You know, hmm. another, uh, you know, this time it's an outlaw movement. And it turns out that they're a kind of sacrificial generation from the 60s to now. Um, now they're the whole, the underground is in a state of collapse, and they're just you know nobody can afford to go legal. And the main character Utah Blue, he's even went to the trouble to go legal with all those taxes and all those regulations, and now he's not renewing his license. People are stopping. You know, the big the big capitalist you know multi level. Cross um, the big corporations are taking over. And, mm -hmm. uh, so it's the end of that hippie counterculture that went back to the land in the 60s, went up to Mendocino and Humboldt in Northern California. And at first they were not growing pot to make money. They were just growing it because they liked to smoke it. Uh, but they discovered that they had some commercial value and they became kind of the the core of the resistance and they transform marijuana into uh, at least homegrown into the best stuff in the world. Um, and uh, there's also camp where, you know, Reagan and the feds, 26 agencies came and invaded for 13 years. The Emerald Triangle up in Humboldt and Mendo was invaded by Blackhawks and people sliding down ropes and coming and cutting down their stuff. And they managed to survive them, kind of like how 
the Afghans survived the Russians. We just, Al says, we're just sort of here and, you know, you got to go. Um, and then there's a story of medical marijuana, and that brought about a kind of semi legal 20 years between medical marijuana and full adult use legalization in, in California. And those were, in retrospect, kind of the golden years. Um, and a lot of innovation, and a, you know, promise and peril. There were people who were put in jail. The federal government was all over, you know, raiding dispensaries and growers and so on. But, um, and then we have the bright new world of legal cannabis. So that's the story we're telling. Hmm. What do you think? Wow, you're just gonna fly us through all that in how 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 long is the movie? No, 120 minutes. Five acts, 120 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I would beg anybody who's interested, please get a hold of us. We're just now fundraising to launch and we need help. It's got to be grassroots. Not any, you know, we're not getting the grants. Duh. <laughs> Repeat. How, how do people support your work? Through your website? Do you have a... Yeah, we're, yeah we're, we're, we're about to put up a website for this project. And we have all the other pieces of it. A trailer, a sample scene, a uh, PowerPoint, uh, a five pager, a one pager, a postcard, all of that. And we're going to debut at Bioneers, which is coming up in about 10 days, um, mm -hmm. and make a presentation there. And then we'll be going to work fundraising. And it's called the Emerald Triangle. Hmm. The Emerald Triangle. Yeah. Which is curious how that name came about. Yes. It turned out. It was the cops, the bad guys, who named it that. And they were trying to, like, do you remember the Golden Triangle in, in Southeast Asia? Thailand, North, Northern Thailand, up against the Chinese border was the Golden Triangle where they were growing opium poppies. Oh. And so the bad guys, the DEAs, um, decided to call, you know, the cannabis heartland Humboldt. In Mendocino and Trinity counties, they call the Emerald Triangle. Hmm. And so the old people don't like it, but the young people, you know, it's a legendary name now. <laughs> it is so full of ironies, that story. Um, that's part of the fun of it, is all the twists and turns and ironies. Anyway. You're telling the story. Did you do a film in between? What, what, do you, what, did you do a film on pesticides and farming? I did Evolution of Organic, which is- Oh, Evolution of Organics. Can you briefly summarize that as well? Because we didn't talk about that, I realized. And sure, it's, um, it's again, it's something like four or five acts and it's about a small band of um misfits or outcasts or contrarians who decided they didn't like chemicals in their food and so they started kind of looking around in the po post-war world war ii america was really when chemical agriculture was introduced in a big way into the united states and a lot of it through the universities and the agricultural extensions and you know learning all the modern ways to farm and so this was a bunch of 60s not necessarily hippies there were some hippies like amigo bob but there were a lot of people who came from farming families and there were also people who were motivated by spiritual disciplines and sort of those three groups of people got together around the ideas of organic and um, started hacking out a way to uh, grow without chemicals. And, um, you know, at first it was a small band of people and they would just have little farmers markets and they have community owned farms and they would, you know, but 
it began to grow. And one of the key things that helped it grow was Alice Waters and Chez Panisse and the food revolution that began. And they were the first to present it as this fabulous new, beautiful, perfect food and really popularized organic. Um, and um, then along came in, what was it? I think it was 84 was um, Alar. It was the chemical, it, no, this is later, it's 90, 91. Alar, CBS 60 Minutes did a report on Alar, which was sprayed on apples to make them firmer. And it turned out that it was toxic. And the folks in NRDC were the ones who sort of blew the whistle on this and they agonized over it. But that's not the story we're telling. The story we're telling is that, you know, the lid blew off and uh, suddenly everybody wanted organic and it doubled um, in every decade, it seemed, in, in size. And, a lot of conventional farmers started to move towards organic because they could see, you know, they had people in the, their family who died young or, or sick or, you know, for the spray, they would know when the spray came over the fields um, that, you know, that they could see the problems coming from. It. So a lot of conventional farmers went organic and that made a big deal of difference. So that there were early people um, in carrots and in lettuce um, who, who made that switch. And um, after Alar it took off and grew and grew and grew and it grew until now, um, you know, it's the biggest growth um, sector within the food industry and it's it's still only a small percentage of the land that's in organic production and you know everybody everybody wants to see the day when the central valley of california is organic hmm. sweet thing <laughs> and we're getting there you know gradually there's a it was interesting to take the film out and show it around in places like Fresno and Merced, and meet some of the farmers who converted and, you know, there's a re really, it's, a, it's, it's impressive. It's been a very successful movement. Yes. You know, a lot of mainstream people have caught on. Where can people watch that? Can they also watch it on all the- Amazon, Apple. Okay. YouTube, uh, what's it called? Google Play, um, Voodoo, yeah. And Bullfrog. <laughs> right, and Bullfrog, thanks. And thanks to them as well for- Yeah, thanks to Bullfrog. Yeah. God, there's some great early environmental films there. And John yeah. Inderhall, who's the, you know, the big, the big guy at Bullfrog, he made a great film on Earth Day that, you know, was, quite radical. Gregory Bateson and all sorts of people, uh, Allen Ginsberg and, you know, they, they, they did a really interesting film, you know, not easy to watch. <laughs> but I was, I was so impressed and glad that, and of course they have the other great film on Love Canal, uh, which is not in my backyard or not in our backyard. Hmm. Made by Lynn, fill in the blank. And that is a great film. And we owe a real debt of gratitude to them for very important footage. Um, so Bullfrog's a great place for environmental stuff. That's sort of yeah. their, their brief, right? Yeah, yeah. Any other picks on Bullfrog? Oh. Well, there's another film Abraham made. Um, I just returned the master of it. It was Looking for Organic America, where they go out west, they go to Iowa, they go to Colorado. You can see the feed pens. They uh, talk to a lot of farmers looking for organic America. That's a pretty old one now. Looking for Organic America. Yeah. Great. 
Well, thank you so much for your time. And I will be sure to put in the links as well when we put this out on YouTube and so forth, how to watch the film and more information about your, your website. Once you get it up, you'll have to send it to me. So, okay, well, okay. and I don't know, did, did, did we talk about the, we prepared for a fear screen fire some uh, materials. We did a timeline, we did a bibliography. It was almost an annotated um, timeline. Uh, do you have any of that material? Are you posting any of it? Is that at Bullfrog? Did you say for for educational? So if people want to show this in school, very yeah, much so. Well, yes, there's a whole teaching. teaching. I have to see. I thought we used to when we had a website. On it, we had a thing, a timeline, and we had um, sort of a guide to environmental organizations, and we had a bibliography and a filmography. And your timeline is still on, is it American Masters? Yes, I think it is, right. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yes. Good. Where you can watch little clips and that's a useful like website where you can go and- Oh, if you're screen fire, you'll get a lot of stuff from American Masters that I thought they did great, you know? They yeah. Have them, you know? I think they should be viewing for high school, college. Most people don't know. They don't know the history. It continues to do well. It's because it's such a big, important movie. And it's so relevant. People want to learn it. People want to teach it. You know? So we made it hoping that it would be the big, the big picture view that would kind of weave together all the pieces and sort of say, oh, that's where I can't. That's environmental, and that, 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 and see how they all come together. Yeah. That was what we were trying to do. And it's also brought a lot of hope. I mean, the, the, uh, you know, some of the things people did when they captured the EPA officials or the, I forget where that, which agency it was. Was it with Lewis Gibbs? Was were they from the EPA, the or, or when they were going after the whales, or protecting the whales? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, that was Lewis Gibbs at Love Canal. They were the ones who kidnapped the EPA officials. Mm -hmm. Okay, EPA. Uh, <laughs> that was great fun. That that who I mean that took guts. I I, I never would have thought of that. <laughs> But now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Just waiting for it. All right. <laughs> yeah. There's always well, another battle. <laughs> there, we have many battles. We're, we're in deep. Well, thank you so much. My and pleasure. thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.